Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Uncommon Comedy Podcast. I'm your host, Brian April. And as always, our episodes are available to listen to on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. You can also watch the video versions on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, if you have any questions or comments about this episode, feel free to leave them in the comments below uh, the video, or you can reach out to me on facebook.com slash comedy Brian, youtube.com uh, slash comedy Brian, and three days a week I live stream on Twitch. So if you want to interact with me live, you can check me out at twitch.tv slash comedy Brian. We're going to get into it today. Uh, my guest today uh, is an extremely, extremely funny comedian, uh, performs all over the globe, performs for the troops. You may have seen him on Drive Bar Comedy. Uh, so we're going to bring in the very funny Mr. Danny Viapando. Danny, how are you, sir? What's up, Ryan? How are you? How much? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, so you, let me, quick question. You, yes. you say your name April? Yes. That It looks like it's Aprelli. Yes, it uh, it is. Um, it's it's pronounced just like the month April. Yeah, it's originally it was uh, when my grandfather came over. It was A P R I L E, and when it was a prelay. Um, uh -huh. But there was another Dominic a prelay, and so they were getting the same. They were getting each other's mail. So he got mad and he changed it and added the P, added an L, and then he changed the pronunciation to April. Really? But that was yep. back in the day when you can do that without any government uh, harassment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were just like, oh, I, cha I changed my name. I'm spelling yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So but I am a Rockefeller I, I, now. But originally you say it, how, how was it said back in the old country? Uh, Aprile. Aprile. Is it Italian? Yeah, it is Italian. Okay. But now it looks French and it's pronounced April. Which April. Makes okay. zero, it, it makes no, there's no rhyme or reason uh, as to why, but that's what it is. And people go, is that a stage name? And I go, yes, I made up yeah. a stage name. No one can spell or pronounce. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's, it's that exactly that's the, the way it doesn't look. Exactly. That, that was that, it's, it's comedy. Yeah. I mean, that's the point of a stage name is to, to make it harder for people to find you. So. <laughs> oh, it's like, like my name. I, I should have changed it years ago. Yeah. Then you get a lot of a, uh, I should have just changed it to like Via, something Danny mm. Via would have been so much easier because I've seen it. it it's misspelled constantly. It's miss, you know, nobody can pronounce it. So, but you know, it is what it is now. It's uh, Via Pando, right? Via Pando, yes. Via Pando. I like that. Say it that way. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, how, what's the worst uh, spelling or pronunciation that you've heard of that? I've actually, I was doing a, uh, a gig for the military and I was overseas and I was, I believe, I was in. Uh, I think it was Germany, <clears throat> and they had just given him the name over the phone. So the guy making the posters for the show just heard it over the phone and decided to spell it the way he wanted to spell it, and it started with a T. <laughs> it was it was like Till Al Doe or something like something crazy where we just laughed. All the comics we just laughed because it was it was so far off. Uh, so you must get your name butchered constantly on stage. constantly. Yeah, Especially, but you know, you get on stage. It's the the MCs are like, "How do you say it? How do you say it? Oh, one more time, right before I go up. How do you say it?" Yeah. No, I just mine's just like. Thankfully, mine is at least it's like the month, and I'll just spell it out like the month for them if I need to. But yeah, because it used to be I got Apple, Aprili, April, Prile, you know, and you. And it's funny you have so many people that you you do shows with for years, and they still butcher your name. And you're like, come on, you should at least know it by now, right? I've got a good friend of mine who produces shows and books me all the time, and still says uh, uh, Villa Ponda. It's Villa Pondo, <laughs> but it always says Villa Ponda. The Villa Ponda. It's a nice. Uh, it's a nice restaurant. Let's go to the <laughs> Villa Ponda tonight. Go there for the spaghetti. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. Um, so, Danny, what I, what I love um, about your, your comedy and your act is um, you are relentless on stage. You have this great, uh, what I like to call, um, like an angry likability to you. <laughs> so it's, you know, you, you, you have like that sharp kind of biting, but it's not done in a very, it's not done in a, a harsh way. It's It's done in a very likable way, which is... Um, so it's you like get a little lovable, bit of lovable sarcasm. Yeah. Lovable sarcasm. That's a great way to do it. Get a little bit of that bitterness, but a little bit of, you know, that sweetness. So you get that nice, uh, combination and, uh, I just love it. You just, you go out and you just, you know, I want you to just murder night after night after night on stage, not off stage. That would be different, 
But um, sure. I really know. Well, yeah, I, that, I, at least I watch. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I do. I love that about you is as you just go out there and you're relentless and you have a, a you're up tempo, you're energetic, you're you're passionate um, uh, about it, and um, and it's just a, a treat. You're always a professional, and you're always very you know. Um, business like on stage and off stage and you're just a, a very humble and down to earth person and I just love uh, love working with you so well, thank you're you very, that's very sweet for you to say thank you oh my pleasure my pleasure so let's um let's get into a little bit about the, your history now um, what uh, started uh, what inspired you to, to start comedy or who well you know you know when I first thought about doing comedy I was always uh, pretty I was pretty a shy a shy kid I still am somewhat shy and introverted uh, and then I just met a, a group of people through a girlfriend and she had a large group of friends where I just started being funny. And because I was just being funny, I was getting the attention, uh, from that. And then from there, I, I actually saw stand up on television years ago. It was like the tonight show or something. I was just, I was a kid. I was probably, uh, maybe 18, 20. When I saw stand up on television, I thought, I thought, wow, that's exactly what I do when I go to, I would go to high school parties and I would just start talking and people would form a group and listen to me just be an idiot. Right. And I saw it on TV and I thought, wow, that's a thing. <laughs> I, was, I was like, wow, I do that already. And that's when I decided, well, I, I guess I'm a comic. Huh. Were there any comedians or anything that kind of influenced you or was just seeing that, uh, the first two, we had we had a, a thing at the house uh, when I was growing up. It was called ZTV, and you probably don't remember that, but it was mm -hmm. it was just when cable was starting to become popular. This was a uh, you bought yourself a special antenna that went on the roof, and it was called ZTV, where you could get all these small shows from around the country. And one of the first comedy shows, stand up shows, where I really got interested in it when I was in my early twenties was uh, Dana Carvey and Kevin Nealon. And they mm. had this thing called uh, New City Cafe out of San Francisco or something something similar to that. And I would watch that special over and over again. And I and I was so fascinated with what they were doing stand-up wise that I, I watched it just constantly and then uh, started doing stand-up. Uh, you know, I, I did stand-up probably once a year after that for uh, almost a decade. I would just do it once a year to get it out of my system because I was like, all right, I did it once. I'm good. You know, I had a job <laughs> and I would just do that. And eventually it just it took hold. Yeah, the bug hit you. Yeah. So do you remember your first show ever? <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely. One of the <laughs> worst experiences of my entire life. So I wanted to do stand-up and I, I, I told my mom this. And my mom was reading the paper one day and there was a uh, an ad for auditions for entertainers. So I had been writing jokes in a little black book for for years just just stuff i thought was funny i would write down the idea and my mom showed me this audition so i went to audition for these three older women and uh grandma types and they're sitting in these chairs and i go to this bar during the daytime and they said well what do you do i said i'm a stand-up comedian they go all right well go ahead and uh, give us some of your jokes i did maybe uh one to two minutes of jokes and they're cracking up. They're laughing. They think I'm hysterical. And they said, can you do 20 minutes? Never being on stage before. Can you do 20 minutes? I'm like, sure. I can do 20 minutes. I've got a whole book of stuff. I can do 20 minutes. So they booked me for what was called Rialto days. Rialto days is where I grew up. It's in the Inland Empire in Southern California. So Rialto days was a festival in a park. So they've got fair, small Ferris wheels and, uh, little roller coasters, and they've got a, a stage. So uh, they had me perform. They wanted me to do 20 minutes. Uh, I, I'm following square dancers. Square dancers are going on. They've got loudspeakers going through the entire park, just blaring out what's going on. So I go up on stage, and I'm supposed to do uh, Saturday and Sunday. On Saturday, they've got these bleachers set up. It's outside. All my friends are there. I do maybe maybe eight minutes of what I think are jokes. And uh, after that, they kind of just, you know, cut me off and pulled me off stage because I was done. I didn't have 20 minutes. I couldn't do 20. Uh, I come walking off stage and then one of the old women walks up to me afterwards and she pats me on the shoulder and she goes, we won't need you tomorrow. <laughs> that was my first experience. And I, I, did, I probably didn't do stand up for another two years after that. Wow. We won't need you tomorrow. We won't need you tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, what? 
My friends thought it was hilarious, though. Just eating it for your first time is funny. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's always funny. First time, twentieth time, thousandth time. It's, yeah. it's it's always funny to other other comics and stuff. Sure. But, uh, how did um, when did you start to get a little more like into it on a uh, a series? Not necessarily serious, but a little more frequently than once a year. You know, I got lucky because I like I said, I grew up in the Inland Empire, and that's when the Montclair Laugh Stop was open. There was two laugh stops. There was one in Newport Beach and the other one was in Montclair. My home club was the Montclair Club. So I'd been doing comedy just at, uh, and this was this was uh, mid 80s to uh, early 90s. I just kind of just, you know, I had a day job and I would just do it then. That's how long I've been doing this, a long time. Mm. And uh, I would just do uh, gigs at night because I had a day job. So then I, st- I got into the Montclair Laugh Stop and I was able to become kind of the house MC where uh, the guy's name was Adam. He was he was a great manager. He put me up on stage so much and you get that experience. And that's back when comedy was booming in the uh, mid to late 80s. Right. I was doing two shows on Thursday. You would do two or three on Friday, three on Saturday. Then you'd do another two on Sunday. I mean, that's how much work I was getting. Wow. And you're making a little bit of money, not not tons, but but the stage time in front of an actual in a comedy club, was so invaluable, so mm. invaluable. It was great. It was awesome. Uh, just real quickly, what is um, what are some what is advice for being a good host? Because there's a lot of people who listen who are either new to this or maybe just need to hear uh, what what the job of a host is <laughs> at a club and and what the what that their job is not. The host. I think it is, is, is you're not going to do well for the, for the amount of time you're up there. The audience kind of wants a little bit of participation at first, and then you've got to, you know, back away from them. And then you've got to, you've got to stick to the jokes. You've got to do at least enough jokes that it gets them into a rhythm of hearing stand up comedy. And once they hear comedy, I mean, you could do a couple minutes up front. How are you? Where are you from? Glad you're here. Here's a couple rules. And then you've got to go into the jokes. And once you get them in that rhythm, you're setting it up for the feature act and for the headliner, and that's that's kind of the job at, if you're if you're the host or you're you're opening. I am so so glad you said that because that is I I that is my biggest pet peeve um, with with host is that they don't understand one it's not about you it's about the show right and the whole thing about establishing the rhythm for the audience is so important. It's um, sets, you're setting up the room for a great night. Is yeah, what, is what you're doing. It's it's and if you do it really well, it, it it's perfect. You know, you you set it up perfectly, and the other comics have a great set and what have you. Yeah, and it's so important because I've seen so many hosts that that just go, oh, I just do crowd work, and it's like you're you're now teaching yeah. the audience it's okay to talk back during the sets and no, yeah. like do your yeah, you know I call it cheerleading in the beginning. You know where you're from, you guys excited, blah blah blah. And then, like you said, hit those jokes and just this, you go. This is what what it's gonna be. And uh, and then I'll see the host go back like after the opener goes up and you know tries to like get the crowd in that rhythm. And then they go back to crowd work again. And then it just completely unravels everything. And and it's so important. It's so important to just establish that rhythm of of expectation of what's coming. Well, and, and then and then what it does is if you're featuring or you're headlining, you're spending five minutes getting them into your style which you should be ready to go right from the get go. Right. But, but if the host screws it up and they start playing with people and getting them to shout stuff back, then you're, then you have to retrain them and tell them, Hey, that's, that's not what I do. I do something different. Here's what I do. Right. And it shouldn't be, you know, it should be up to the headline. I always think it should be up to the headliner. If they want to go into the crowd or whatever, it's the headliner. They're there to see them or right. they're the, they're the one that basically makes the biggest impact on the show. So uh, as a host, you kind of leave it to, you know, the headliner and to, if they want to play with the audience, that's great. If they don't, that's great. It's totally up to them. Yeah. They absolutely. The, the, head, the headliner is the guy. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's, it's, I just think it's really important for, for people to hear that because a lot of people just go, well, I want to do well. Well, you're not going to do as well as you want to do as the host. You can still do well, but <laughs> you know, like whenever I would host, it would be, you know, get the crowd. Your job is to get them to, to shut up, to focus and then to laugh, <laughs> you know, they can, in that order. And then once you do that, you know, I would always go, okay, they're not with me here. It's not going great now, but by the time I bring up the, the opener, I want them 
on my side and with me and laughing. And that was always my goal as the host. And there's a difference between between doing well and doing well talking to the audience. And and I think a lot of young comics think if they're just messing with the audience, getting laughs from that, that's it. But where else can you do that? Hmm. Nobody's going to give you a TV spot doing that. Right. You've got to have an act to, to move past that. That's otherwise, true. That's otherwise, you'll just be, you, you, I mean, you could kill it in bars for the rest of your life if that's what you want to do. <laughs> Which, but that's all you're going to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so let's get back to you a little bit. Um, how long did it take for things to start to click for you before the, the uneven shows, you know, a couple good ones, a couple bad ones, how, before it started to level up for you? Uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a progression that that continues to grow. I don't think, I don't, I almost don't think you're ever done unless there are those few comics that just hit their stride. They know who they are, and that they just move forward from that point. I'm always learning something different. I mean, even recently, I was doing cruise ships, and then from that, I learned how to be a a different type of performer or a better performer, just based on the material. Your material has to be better for a, a wider group of people. Uh, that being said, I never enjoyed working cruise ships because my style didn't play well with them. Because like you said at the beginning, I'm a little sarcastic and angry, and but I'm not really angry. It's, 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 right. a, false, it's a false anger in a sense. But for some reason on the, the cruise ship, people never got that. They always thought, wow, this guy's kind of edgy or whatever. And I'm really not. But right. I got that opportunity to get past that. And you you learn how to adjust based on that. So when did things click for me? I, I would probably say fairly recently in the past probably five years, you start to learn how to adjust on the fly to different crowds. And that's that's important to do because a lot of times if you like, you know, you stick to your guns and what you're doing and sometimes people just don't buy it. So mm -hmm. it is, I, I think it's a constant thing that you're always learning. I mean, I know, just speaking for myself, I'm always learning how to and trying to be better. So for uh, people who are, are not comedians who are listening or watching, what um, what kind of goes through your mind when you're trying to decide on how to uh, adjust on the fly? Like, what are some of the factors that you, you – what's going on through your brain? How come these people aren't laughing? <laughs> that, that makes you adjust really quickly. Yeah. You know, yeah. when you try to figure out, like, early early on when I was uh, uh, doing a lot of club work on the road, I would notice that in the Midwest, uh, I had to slow down a lot. And I had to speak so much slower that it was uncomfortable for me because I, I came up in a culture where it was just set up, boom, set up, boom, set up, boom. I mean, I, was, I would just bang my jokes every few seconds. And I could do that at the clubs. Uh, like, one of my favorite clubs was in Tucson, and I played a lot of the Southwest and in California. You could speak fast and you could hit your jokes fast and you could move, move, move. Then when I w would play some of the clubs in the Midwest, I just had to slow down so much because I didn't understand what they didn't get. Mm. It did, to me, it didn't make sense. I'm like, what? I'm doing my act the way I always do my act. And in and, and Wisconsin, these people just, they, they just don't get it. So then when I slowed down a lot, then the laugh started to come and started mm. to roll. But it was, it was uncomfortable for me to learn, but you have to make those adjustments. Absolutely, it's 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 a weird uh, process, and then you see the different pockets of uh, the country, or even just states, just from night to night. Yeah, uh, even even in the same city, uh, di different crowds, you can be the same way each night and have two completely different reactions. And there's some oh. nights you do have to slow down. From Friday to Sunday, it's totally different. You're working a comedy club. The second show on Friday night is always almost one of the worst nights of the week. <laughs> yeah. the best, the best nights are like your Wednesdays, Thursdays, middle of the week. People are still excited. Friday, second show. They've worked all week. They're tired. They've had dinner. They've had a few drinks. They show up for the nine o'clock show and they're just, they're just tired. Their energy's not there. Mm -hmm. And then third show Saturday is uh follow, follows that right after that. It's just absolutely. Yeah. They're drunk at that point. Yeah, it's it's not even a show at that point. It's right. it's just kind of babysitting, and you can just go up and, I mean, no one's really paying any attention at that point anyway. It's crazy. Yeah. I don't know why they do third shows on Saturday. You start at eleven o'clock. You know, it's it's 
it's so I've never understood the third show on a Saturday. Like, let's just have two coherent groups. <laughs> And it's always small. It's always like 30 people, if that. Yeah, it, it, do, it doesn't even seem worth it, really. It, it really doesn't. But, you know, they're selling they're selling booze. So that's that's really what we're that's what we're there for. If they could get dancing monkeys to, to have people come in and charge them two drinks, then we wouldn't be here. So it's a, it's a glamorous world we live in. Bro. <laughs> it really is. Glamorous. So uh, when you were starting out, what was, uh, or even later, what was one of the best pieces of advice that uh, you ever received about uh, performing or comedy? Best advice? I was scolded one time. Okay. I was a comic. Uh, and uh, I used to work Palm Springs all the time. There was a club out there, a weekend club, called the Comedy Haven. It was ran by Phyllis Silver, who uh, every time she would pay you, she'd roll up your money. And she'd hand it to you. And uh, there was always like 20 or $40 missing from it. So you talk to I learned once I got home a couple of times going, wait a minute, she shortchanged me money. Every time you had to unroll it and you had to count it. So you used to work Comedy Haven all the time. And uh, there was a comic, I think his name was Dave Tyree, I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, I was hosting at the time. And uh, I, you, I, ne I never wear a watch. To this day, I still don't wear a watch. But... Back then, I just uh, never had a watch on, and I would go over my time. And he and he pulled me aside, and he goes, he goes, look, if you want to be a comedian, you want to be a professional comedian, get a watch and learn how to use it. Stop taking other people's time. Said it just like that, and and to this day, it's, it's one of the most important things I know. You don't go over on your time. You do your time that that you're allotted, and uh, don't be stingy. <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. That was um, that's something I never go on stage without a watch uh, because I, I started off in Boston and you needed a watch to go you know go on stage because you generally kept your own time, um, so they didn't have someone lighting you. If you got the light, that meant like you weren't coming back. Right. So they would they would give you a window. They would say, okay, uh, you're doing ten to twelve. You know, so so it wasn't like a you know it wasn't like at the the comedy store. It's like you're doing from you know nine forty five to to nine fifty two right. or anything like that. But it was like okay, you're doing ten to twelve minutes, and then you just kept your own time, and everyone just kind of did that. And so the host didn't have to you know they would run it too, but um, they they never lit you or anything like that. So when I moved out to Southern California, and they're like, when do you want your light? And I'm like, I don't need a light. Like I'm good. <laughs> and so to this day though, I still have a watch because you know you know if you're doing a a corporate gig. There's, there's not going to be somebody back there, you know, giving you a light at, at 30 minutes or an hour. Like, you need to know your, your stuff. Uh, and now they have all the smart watches where you can get the silent alarm, which is great. So I have it hit when I want my light. And then, uh, you know, so it vibrates and I go, oh, there's my light. And, uh, you know, or if I want to just wrap up, I'll, so I'll see the light and then I'll feel the watch and I go tell my joke and get off. I record all my sets. So mm -hmm. now that we have a, a phone... I've got a an app on the phone that I just set it up. It's got it's got a a, a clock on it, and it's and we're recording my set, so I can mm. see where I'm at at any moment in my set. Yeah, I just think it's really important that that the, the comic knows <laughs> you know where you are in your in your sure in your time absolutely. Um, so, what is your writing process like? My writing process is uh, I. I, I don't write on stage. I write, I try to write everything uh, at home. Uh, I learned a good trick, but uh, do you know a comic named Bobby Tessel? Not by name, no. Bobby Tessel, he's, he's, he's a very funny guy. He's done uh, The Tonight Show. He's done Letterman. Uh, and I asked him one time, what is your writing process? Because I love that he's got all uh, jokes, really good jokes, smart jokes. He said he starts, he, here's how he explained it to me. He starts off, you know what a family tree looks like. You know, you've got the tree and you've got all the branches that go off. The trunk of the tree is the idea that you start off with. You start off with that idea and then you try to branch it out. Well, what, what does this idea have to do with these 10 different things? What do these 10 different things have to do? What other 10 different things does this have to do or this, this branch, this branch, this branch? Then you find, then you just spider web it out from that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the writing process that, I do is I like, well, what does this mean? And what other ideas have to do with this? Then you start with one idea, you come up with five ideas that are based on the one item. 
then mm-hmm. you branch all those out and you keep going, keep going. Sometimes you'll start off with an idea you think is great and the bit will end up someplace completely different and hopefully it's better. Right. But that's kind of how I do it. Do you, um, once you kind of get structure of it, do you practice uh, into the mirror? Do you just go up on stage? And like, when do you bring it on stage? I I, I don't bring it on stage until I think I've got something to say. I, I, I don't want to him and haw while I'm standing there. I don't, I don't want to say, so what else is going on? Which you see a lot of young comics do. And you're like, and they're like, hmm. And they're just, just wasting time. Have something to say. And then I, and then say it is, is kind of how I, I try to operate. So I, I write the bit down, <clears throat> excuse me. I write the bit down verbatim, every single word I write it down. I mean, one joke will be a paragraph. And then from that, I just read it over and over again and then edit as I go along. Because I want, I want as you know, you write a joke, you want as few words as you can. So you edit out a lot of the stuff that doesn't, structurally mean anything to the joke it's you don't want too many words that just don't mean anything here's what i want to say here's the punchline here's what i want to say here's the punchline so you're telling a story in as in jokes and you try to keep it as tight as you can yeah and get rid of the little things like you know what i mean and uh what i'm trying to say and oh that drives it drives me nuts when comics and you hear it so much where they're like, you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? No. Why don't you know what you're talking about? <laughs> and then you won't have to ask that question all the time. It, it drives me nuts to, to watch and hear that. Yeah, it's so true. You just see this like wandering through the this forest trying to get to the punchline. And-, and they're trying to figure out what they want to talk about before they, I mean, don't do it on stage. You're, you're wasting the audience's time. You're wasting your own time. Mm-hmm. If I'm the one up after you, you're wasting yep. my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's so, it's so important. Uh, and people don't realize that. And I, yeah. I get so annoyed with that because I'm like, just get off. I, I always just say to myself, get off my stage. Like, because I get stuff I want to say. I get stuff that I want to do. I have goals and I have things I want to accomplish. I, I spent time writing this stuff, so I'm ready to go. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, and you're also, you know, you're up in uh, LA and it's a very, very competitive. I mean, you get the best of the best that go out there. So you, you don't have time to mess around. No, I, I, I no, you don't. Yeah. You're, you're getting the best comments from all over the country. Like seven minute sets uh, at most of the LA clubs. So it's, it's pretty quick. Yeah. And so you're, you know, you're trying to, you go it against the best of all these people who've come from these other locations. And so you have some good people that uh, want to get on stage and, and do something and, and, and work stuff. And so if you're up there just messing around, that's, uh, let's go, let's move it. That's also up to the clubs though. The clubs need to watch that too and, and say, Hey, you're, you're just, you know, you're not ready for this room yet. Hmm. You know, you've got to come in here. You've got to do your, your, your TV seven minutes, you know, bang, 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 bang. Don't, don't just get up there and just goof off. And you just brought something up, uh, your, your TV seven. What is the importance, do you think, of having that? Because so many people just go, I just want to say what I want to say. And it's like, well, are, you know, do you want to get on TV or what, what is your goal? So what, what is the importance of a good, uh, tight seven-minute TV set? You should have that ready to go uh, as soon as you can get it. That should be the first thing you work on. Because, it, it, you know, what was great about Conan O'Brien's show is she would put on a lot of young comics, a lot. I mean, some of them possibly not ready for TV yet, but 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 he was so good. He would he would give a young comic a shot and you could tell who was ready and who wasn't ready. You know, you could just just because I've been around so long, you can really see it. You can see a person going, well, they're still kind of at the open mic stage. You can tell who's a working comic and who's just kind of in L.A. doing their thing. Right. But it's, I yeah. think it's important to have. I think it's important, especially when you're in uh, Los Angeles, you need to have that tight seven minutes. Then you need to have like about a 10 to 12 minute. Then you need to have like a 20 minute because that's about all you're going to be doing unless you're headlining someplace. Absolutely. And, you know, you see all these people who are like, oh, I'm going to try to get on America's Got Talent and I'm going to try to, you know, do this. And it's like you are you have to just be you know super focused. And there is a difference between performing in a club and on TV. You know, or performing oh, yeah. a set. Um, let me uh, ask you this. this: is my favorite question to ask, and so everyone knows what's coming. Uh, what is your, or what was your worst show ever? Oh, there's, there's so many to choose from. 
<laughs> this is this is probably uh, the worst show I've ever had. I, and I don't I don't even necessarily know if it was my fault, but I'm a young comic, uh, and I'm doing. Uh, it was in like uh, Claremont, and it was a lamp post pizza, and it was it was a uh, kind of a college college uh, hangout because the place was jam packed uh, with with young college people drinking beers. So it was, and the MCs set it up so horribly because they would just mess with the crowd and call them names, and they would rile them up and get them to yell stuff back. So it was a badge of honor if you could even do well in this room, because you really had to take it to them. And it was it was graphic, and it was it was a dark place to work. So, but as a comic, your your ego's like oh, I I can I can do this, I, I can win these people over. And they were famous for doing the the chant that na 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 hey goodbye. If they didn't like you, that chant would start. I get up on stage and I'm I'm trying my hardest to get them on my side. And all of a sudden the chant starts slowly, you know, and you, 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 that pressure in your body builds up and you're starting mm -hmm. to panic and you're starting to talk faster. Cause you think, well, if I talk faster, I can get these people. Kid in front walks up and hands me a, a beer and he quiets the audience down, puts his hand up. He's like, quiet, quiet, quiet. He hands me a beer and I'm like, Oh, one guy gets me. One guy's going to be cool. The minute I grab the beer, he goes, now get the F off the stage. And the crowd goes nuts. And then they start the chant. And you got to walk. You got to walk through these people to the back of the room while they're just telling you how awful you are. I mean, wow. it, it, I mean, that it, it hurt for a long time. Let me tell you, wow. it was tough, but so uh, how did but the worst ever. Yeah. That's so silence. silence is better than that. Wow. That's, that's <laughs> brutal. That is brutal. How do you uh, how do you mentally deal with that as a comedian? Uh, you know, you just you keep moving forward. It's like it's like anything in life. I mean, every, everybody has a setback. Mm. We all get setbacks, but it's it's what you do during that time. I mean, I wore it for a little while. It it hurt, but you just I just you just keep moving forward. You just keep writing. You keep performing, and and. You know, it's like like they were saying comedy. You're only as good as your last show. You have a mediocre show and you're not happy with it. I mean, we, us comics, we walk around with that for a couple of days going, oh, that just wasn't that good. Until your next show, you do really well and you're on top of the world again. You're like, all right, good. I'm, I'm back. Yeah. The redemption set, as I call yeah, it. it. It wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the redemption set. It's funny you mentioned you start to speed up uh, because I think that's uh, something a lot of – and I, I catch myself too sometimes going, oh, speed up, speed up. And it's like, nope, slow down. Um, and it just totally your, – your brain starts to melt when you're bombing like that. You're, you're just yeah. like – you're just reaching for anything you can to like grab to like stop the – you know, stop the ship from sinking. It's and I just, did that for, I, for years. I, I – it's a lesson that took me forever to learn was to slow down. I just, I just kind of grew up in my career and just, just doing a lot of bar bars. And when you do bars, you're just, you're, you're hitting them hard and you're hitting them fast. And then if it didn't go well, you, you, you'd double down on that. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to learn it. Sometimes if you do slow down, they, the audience oddly becomes quiet and they start listening. Because they're like, well, I don't hear this guy anymore. What's going on? Right. Or if they're too drunk, they just continue to talk over. Sure, exactly. <laughs> Those are the two like extremes. Because sometimes you go, well, maybe I'll get a little louder and I can kind of like quell them that way. And then maybe I can, you know, if I get, you know, get quiet, then uh, then maybe it'll it'll kind of. And those are little try. tricks you learn. Those are little tricks you learn. And you try both of them when you're on that stage, you know. Yeah, so I guess um, kind of in that in that same vein, how do you deal with hecklers or somebody you know talking? What are some of the tips that you do to one quiet a crowd when they're talking, and then how do you deal with like hecklers? Hecklers, I shush them. I don't engage them. I don't. I don't talk to them. I might say a couple things to them, but usually I just I just shush them. Like I I continue talking, but I look at them. I I'll, I snap my fingers, and when they kind of look at me, I just go shh. And I keep talking. I just shush them and I keep talking. And usually that's so shocking to them. They're like, what? They're like, oh, he's not going to engage me. And for the most part, it works. 
if somebody's so hammered, then I mean, I, I was in uh, what was it, Little Rock, and there was a woman so drunk that nothing could be done. I was even asking the people at her table, "Please, can you make this woman shut up?" And they they just kind of went, "Where, where we see, you know, we we brought her here. We spent a lot of time with her. We we can't we can't control her." So interesting. So, uh, so how do you deal with like the the heckler? I mean, your your act doesn't necessarily uh, lend itself to heckling uh, because you're you're very you know fast paced. But how do you I, deal I, with? I, don't ask questions. Yeah. If you ask an audience questions, then they will respond. I I never ask questions. I just keep moving. Hmm. That's yeah. Because or personally, personally, I don't want their opinion. <laughs> There's a reason that I'm standing in front of them. It's because I, I have something I want to get out. There you go. Yeah. Well, that's that's so important, though. And somebody had always said that to me. They go, don't ask um, a question that you're not prepared for the answer. You know, any answer. Yeah. And it's it's it, it's not a conversation. Right. Yeah. It's a monologue. Yeah. If I do ask a question, it's always to lead into something that I want to talk about. You know, how many people have experienced this? And then maybe they'll applaud and then you go right into it. You don't, you don't go, Oh yeah, really where or how or with who I don't do any of that. I just, I just move forward from that point. Mm, absolutely. Uh, we are currently talking with Danny Villapando, uh, very, very funny comedian. And he actually has a, a dry bar comedy special out. Uh, you can check it out at drybarcomedy.com slash Danny V that's D A N N Y and the letter V. Uh, do you remember the name of your, the title of your, a show? Yeah, I absolutely do. The, the, here, here's how I came up with the title of the show. I was working for uh, on the cruise ships for Royal Caribbean, and I was, uh, oh no, actually this was NCL, Norwegian Cruise Lines. I was working for them, and they let me go because they said that I was too informative. <laughs> <laughs> that was the reason that they that I was fired from the cruise line. They said I was too informative. And that's you've seen my comedy. That's what it is. You 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 talk about things that you're interested in, and then the jokes come from that. They said I was too informative. So that's the name of my dry bar special. It's called Too Informative. Too informative. And you can check that out at drybarcomedy.com slash Danny V. Uh do you have any social media that uh uh uh, you, you can Google my name, Danny V Comedian, on uh, YouTube, and you can find uh, hundreds of videos of stuff I've done. A lot of the dry bar stuff's right there. But go check out the special. Watch the whole special. It's better that way. Absolutely. It's definitely better that way. It's uh, one of the best ways you can support uh, comedians is to, to check out their work, especially on dry bar. So um, what is the weirdest place that you've ever performed? Weirdest? Weirdest. I did a... Uh, <laughs> I've done so many, uh, a couple of interesting ones, but the weirdest was uh, Monday morning, about eight o'clock in the morning in a doctor's office for seven people. <laughs> okay, how did that happen? On a, it was just a corporate gig. It was one of the doctor's birthdays and somebody wanted to hire a comedian to come in. So I walked into the guy's office. There's seven people all sitting around with cupcakes for his office. And then they're like, oh, we got you a comedian. And you just, 8 a.m. telling jokes. It was the most awkward. It was okay, though. It was fun. They kind of laughed. The nice thing is, is, you know, by 8.30, you're done for the day. you got a check in your hand. You're driving home. You're like, all right, I did it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got, I got you, that already. Now, do you like doing those kind of like bizarre, um, like different location type of shows? No, not really. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't prefer it. I was... Uh, what was the oh gig? Do you do gig masters? Uh, no, I, I don't because I've seen some of the things that come on there. I I was doing gig masters for a while, and for those of you that don't know, gig masters is a uh, something you sign up to. You put your video on it, and if people want to hire an entertainer, they go on it, and then you discuss with them. You get the gig, you, and then gig masters gets a cut of it. I did. Uh, I was doing some gigs for that, and then I quit doing them because they would be a lot of birthday parties in somebody's backyard. I did Thanksgiving in somebody's living room in front of the television set while they're all at the Thanksgiving table. That one was awful. It was it was <laughs> the worst because it's just a family sitting around for Thanksgiving, and you're just in front of their TV telling jokes. It was, 
and I had to do 30 minutes. And that's talk about watching your watch. I was watching that like a hawk. And the minute I got to 28 minutes, I'm like, that's good enough. I'm out of here. Oh my gosh. What, why would you, why would you think that that's a good idea for Thanksgiving? You know what? It's as a comic, sometimes you just need a gig. Right. You know, it's like, they're going to pay me how much for 30 minutes? And they're like, okay, that, that, that's yeah. worth it. I'll stand there for 30 minutes. I've done it. I've done it for nothing. I might yeah. as well make some money doing this, you know? And it, yeah. I think it was only like 250 bucks, but I was like $250 for 30 minutes. It was, it was within a, like a 40 minute drive from my house. I'm like, eh, that's worth it. I'll go knock it out real quick. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't fun, but after, once you're driving home, you're paid that it gets better. Yes. Yeah, when you it's not fun when you're in the middle of it, but the minute you're done driving home, you're like, "All right, the sun's just setting. I'm, I'm perfect. I'm good." It's funny when you're driving to the gig and you're like, "What am I doing this for?" And then you get there and you're like, "Really? What? Why? Why didn't I say no? What am I doing this for?" And then while you're performing, it's the same thing. And then it starts to get to the point like, "All right, we're almost, we're almost home. We're almost halfway." You know? Yeah. And just no, get that I, check. I, I, and my wife tells me all the time. She, was, she, she tells me, "Why do you agree to do this stuff?" when it, it you don't really want to be doing it. And I'm like, I don't know. It's just like somebody offers you a gig or you, you want to get a gig. You're like, yeah, I'll go do it. Then when the day comes, you're like, why am I here? You're <laughs> One of the last things I, I did like that was, it was uh, within a year, I was in Monrovia at some dirty dive bar that some, some kid was booking. And it was just the worst. He said the show starts at 8. I'm a professional. I'm there at 730 and there's nobody in the bar. All of a sudden, nine o'clock comes around and there's no activity, nothing going on. So I got up and walked and I was like, why did I, why did I do this? Why did I, why did I agree to do this? And then come to find out, I guess they say eight o'clock, but then, you know, how these bar shows sometimes are, it, this thing didn't even get going until 930 or so. But he, the guy, the booker didn't tell me that. Right. So yeah. I mean, it, not really my fault. I'm, I'm I'm a pro. You tell me eight o'clock. I'm there early. So exactly, and that's right. uh, that's so important to be professional. Can you just touch on that real quick? Just it's it's I, I mean it's it's show business, and it, it's really more business than anything else. You've got to be really professional to be uh, any good at this. I learned that lesson uh, like for years. I worked on the road, and I was uh, uh, kind of a, a B club headliner. So I wasn't working the A clubs. I would get spots at them, but I still wasn't headlining them. But I was headlining all the B clubs around the country, which is, it, it's fine. It's, it's a, a little good uh, network to have. And there was, a, I was working with a feature act who every day sat and wrote, wrote. And I asked him one day, you know, two days in, I'm like, I'm like well, what are, you, what are you doing every day? He said, I, I'm, I'm writing. And he looked at me like I was crazy because I at that point, I never sat and wrote. And I was like, he's writing. What? 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 What is this? And from that point forward, that's when I started writing everything down verbatim. I like my, my entire act is every single word is written down, so I can just go back to my act and and read it, and I know exactly where I'm at. And you, the material becomes better, it becomes tighter if it's all structured like that. I think, and hmm. that works Absolutely. for me. I'm not very smart. That's why it works for me. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's good though. But it's, the, it's so important to just treat people well, treat the, the yeah. staff well. Like just those little things. Show up early or on time. You know, I it's it's so funny. You say, "Hey, show starts at eight. You know, you should be there a half hour." Easy, yeah, easy. And I, I'm always yeah. that guy. And especially if it if I've got to go, if, if if it's a couple hour drive, you know, getting around L.A. I mean. When I work Ventura, I'm I'm South LA, so I've got to go through LA to get to Ventura. If I've got a gig uh, that starts at eight, I mean, sometimes I'm leaving in the middle of the afternoon. I go and I see a movie, and I have a little dinner, and then I do the show, and then just drive home. Because right. you know, being late it stresses me out. I, I hate being late. I am right there with you. And before you know, like GPS was prevalent in uh, in the cars and in phones and all that when I was doing back, you know early, you know, late nineties or whatever. And we had MapQuest, uh -huh. you know, and it was just like, Oh, it's going to take this amount of time. But yeah, you absolutely had to make sure you were there, especially if you didn't know where you're going. You know, I was going from Massachusetts to somewhere in Maine and it's like, you need to know, you know, you got to allow for, for getting lost. You got to allow for like road closures. You got to allow for like, there was no, Oh, uh, this route is closed. We're going to redirect you this way and save you time. There was none of that. So Oh, my first, my first road gigs were in a, I had a 1990 Honda Civic 
and I had a Thomas guide and you'd map everything out. And sometimes, I mean, you'd have eight hour drives between shows and it, and uh, that, that's miserable. It's miserable at that stage. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if I could say it's fun at, at first, but if you're traveling with another comic, it's okay. Yeah. If you're, if you're just alone doing these gigs, it's, it was miserable. That's definitely miserable. It's, it's, and it's hard to find good camaraderie on the road. Really. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so, so I guess, uh, what advice do you have for for new comics? New comics, I think we've we've covered it. Just be professional. Yeah. Write your stuff down before you get on stage. Don't get on stage and 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 him and ha. And so, what else is going on? Or, you know, even like uh, a lot of times, uh, I've heard other comics say it's unprofessional to have notes. If you can have a note on a bar stool that that you can glance at it, I think that's okay. But you know, don't go up with a notebook and flip through it while you're standing there. You know that that that's unprofessional. But a note with five ideas written down on it that you can just glance and see is mm -hmm. I think is okay. And, and if if you need the note, have the note. I when I, when I'm working out new bits, I'll have five ideas written down on a piece of paper, and it's right next to my phone, so that I can glance down at it. But the audience doesn't know what I'm doing, but I can see it. Right. So what just I, be professional, show up on time, be nice to everybody because, you know, if, if you treat one of the staff at a club badly, you never know in a year from now if they're going to be managing the club. You don't know that. And it happens a lot. So, you know, be kind, tip well. Yeah. The, the last thing, uh, you know, that a booker or a manager wants is to hear complaints from the staff. Exactly. Yeah. The staff controls what's going on because a lot of times the owner uh, booker is not there at night so much. So you'd be kind to them. You tip. Even if you get, I tip, even if I get a water, if I get a water, throw the guy something. I think it's always, it, it comes around. So always be polite. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, what you said about having the notes or whatever, what I would do is I would uh, put it on a napkin and then put my water next to it or on yeah. it. So it looks like I'm not, what you know get i'm protecting the stool but i'm just have it there for the those couple of bullet points for the new jokes that i wanted to do absolutely i don't think there's anything wrong with that yeah i've, I've heard uh, other guys say no you got to learn your stuff before going up but sometimes you know yeah. if you're glancing at something i think it's perfectly okay well i mean even when you get into like the some of the bigger uh arenas there are certain comedians that uh, have monitors down at the front that have their set lists on it i mean so oh. That would be nice too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm looking forward to those days. I would, I would turn the monitor around and say, "Why don't you guys just read this? I'm going to go to the bar get a drink." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I guess. Um, do you have any weird uh, audience stories from all your time of uh, doing comedy? Just you know, uh, we always hear the stories about fights or you know someone getting dragged out or or something happening. So whether it was to you or to another comic, what's one of the like funnier kind of stories or, or road stories that uh, you may have seen or been involved in? One of, one of the strangest uh, things that's ever happened to me was uh, I was in Iraq back in two thousand and three or four, uh, and in Iraq doing a military tour. And they have us out on this giant flatbed truck and they've got a bunch of soldiers in these fold up chairs sitting there and we're doing a show for them and you're performing. And then all of a sudden a giant siren goes off and it's just ring and ring and ring. And all of a sudden half the audience gets up and starts running. And uh, I forgot who was on stage. It was, uh, it was me, Gary Brightwell, Robert Hawkins. One, one of us was on stage at the time but this siren goes off and all of a sudden half the audience gets up, starts running. And the other half of the audience is just still sitting there. Like, like they weren't even stressed at all. And we're like, what, well, what the heck just happened? Why did all these guys go running? And they go, Oh, they had to go do something or whatever. So you just had to perform for the rest of the people that were still sitting there. But it was such a shocking thing to see these guys get up and run like that. You're like, well, mate, should I be running too? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what, what is it like? Uh, take us through uh, performing for the troops, because uh, there's a lot of people who have no idea what what, it, what it's like to go do that. Uh, it's 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 humbling. It's uh, it's gratifying. It, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you're doing especially when you've I mean, you've got these 17 year old kids coming up to you who have never been on their own. And now they're in, a, in a, another country. 
And I mean, they shake your hand like they, they want to take you with them. They're like, thank you. Thank you so much for giving us a little a little back of uh, of America, what we missed or, or you know, and they, they just they're so grateful to have something. Uh, I mean, we I've done so, so much stuff like that. It, it's 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 an honor to do it. I mean, we even went to. Uh, and this was one of the hardest things uh, that I've had to do. We went to the. Uh, it was the hospital in Germany where the soldiers, when they're injured, they go right to the hospital in Germany. It's the big one there. I, I can't think of the name of it. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But we had to go there and uh, and just just not really entertain them, just handshake, uh, ask where they're from, you know, tell them a couple of jokes while they're in their beds and stuff like that. And that was it was hard to do because you don't know how to do that. You want to give them sympathy, but that's not what they want. They just want you to, you know, hey, where you from? Oh, I've been, I've been to Wisconsin, or I've been to Texas, and you know, you just chat them up a little bit, and you tell them, come in, you throw out a couple of jokes at them, and then you go to the next room and you do the same thing. And that was one of the, it was a hard thing to do, but it, it was, it just, you feel so good afterwards, and you really hope you, you, you hope you did something for them, you know. Mm -hmm. So ho hopefully, hopefully, it helped their day out, or you know, what have you. And that's, I mean, that's such an awesome thing, uh, uh, doing that and even performing for the troops. But most people don't realize, you know, the the locations and the venues that you're at when you're performing for the troops and the transportation and what that's all like. It's just hopping on a chopper and yeah, you know, just flying to the next place. And just, you know, now you're on the, like you said, on the back of a flatbed truck or you're in the, you know, the mess hall or you're, you know, all these different uh things and it's a, it's a lot of travel it's a lot of work and it's it's uh, travel is is grinding too i mean we would you'd you'd be leaving los angeles and you would have to uh fly all the way to, to the middle east and then when you when you would get there you'd have a show like that evening and you're exhausted from j the travel just would would wipe me out i mean you're going from here to new york from new york to either germany or, or london then you'd go somewhere else down south and then you'd go finally wind up in in Bahrain or UAE or somewhere over there. And then, and then you did drive you that show you dump your stuff off and go, all right, you guys have an hour. And then your show starts. You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> We've been traveling for 24 hours straight. What? We got a show now. So That's crazy. It, was still, it was still good to do. I've been to like 21 different countries around the world. So I, you get to see a lot too. So there's, there's that too. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. That's definitely a very cool thing. Uh, we are talking with Danny Villapando a uh, very, very funny comedian. You can check him out, uh, his Dry Bar Comedy special, drybarcomedy.com slash Danny V. Uh, that's drybarcomedy.com uh, slash Danny V. Make sure you check that out and uh, support that. Watch the whole special. It's a, it's a great special. And it is called Too Informative, um, which he got from being fired from Norwegian Cruise Lines. <laughs> because I'm too informative. Too informative. I, I think that's hysterical. That's uh... it, it was funny. I, I, it was funny when I when that happened to me, and I, I spoke with many other people. I had a, a friend of mine whose uh, cruise ship agent. I, I said, "Can can she get my report from the ship?" She got my report, and it it I, it actually says that I was too informative, uh, and that's one of the reasons why they let me go. And I was like, "Wow, okay." So, what what does that even mean? Does that mean you were trying to be? Talk, talk about talk, like we what does that even mean I, you know what you tell me you've seen my act i i don't know i i don't know i yeah. i have no idea but i thought it was funny when the special came up i was like that's a perfect name for it i'm doing <laughs> <laughs> uh he told us he has a wife that's too informative it's too much yeah <laughs> don't get it but I just, you know, I guess uh, not enough fart jokes or, or whatever, maybe. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> That's so bizarre. That's so bizarre. Uh, so one of the things uh, we, we talk about in this, we talk a lot of comedy on this, uh, but we also like to talk about charity. And I, I know you do, uh, you don't have necessarily one specific charity uh, or organization. You you do a lot with a bunch of different things. So um, you're a very charitable person. I was wondering if you just talk a little bit about the importance of, um, of being charitable and uh, helping people. Well, I love the idea that now on, on Facebook, if somebody has a birthday, it's like, don't give me any gifts. Here's a charity, uh, support them and what have you. And that I do a lot of that, you know, uh, uh, 
it just, if somebody needs help, help, it's always a good thing to give out a little bit. I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make or break me, but if it helps somebody out, then, then I'm all for that. I don't have a specific charity that I donate to, but throughout the year, it's always something somewhere. And, and that's fun to do. It's like, it's like, sure, if it helps out. Yeah. And why, you know, why is that good for people, especially, you know, in the, the situation we're in now with the, you know, uh, pandemic and all of that. Why is, why do you feel it's important to, to just, um, give that part to, you know, to, to help other people? Well, you know, so many people right now, especially during this pandemic, I mean, I, I feel so bad for the people losing businesses. I mean, there's people who, who, whose dream it was to start a business, uh, be it a restaurant or something like that. And this was mid 2019, you know, and they threw everything they had into this business. And then all of a sudden, this happens and they're, they're seven months in and, you know, I think it's unsurvivable for a lot of these people and you, you feel, you feel bad for that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, if uh, you know, we, we just encourage people on here to, to just reach out, find an organization that uh, you connect to if there's uh, you know, whether it's uh, uh, something about health or if it's about um, you know, racial equality, or if it's about uh, you know, if it's a religious um, you know, mission, uh, organization, whatever it is that, that suits you, just kind of reach in. And even if it's just a little bit, you should, you know, try to, to give out and help other people because you'll feel right. amazing for, for doing so. Um, but Danny, uh, again, one more time, if you want to uh, check out Danny's dry bar special, drybarcomedy.com slash Danny V, D-A-N-N-Y, called Q Informative. Uh, Danny, uh, looking forward to getting back out on the road and, and performing when this all ends eventually maybe I, I love you so hopefully we'll uh, meet at a gig very soon that would be great and uh, i want to thank the the viewers and listeners for for tuning in and and thank you danny for taking some time today and uh telling us a little about your story and your thought process and uh finding out more about you man i appreciate you and uh hope to see you soon thank you thank you for having me